let me start with a story that, or a context that relates to what we're going to discuss here uh, today. Because I'm originally from Portugal, and I've been for about maybe a year and a half in the remunerations committee of the large Portuguese bank, which is, turns out to be a state-owned bank. And last year, the bank was almost resolved, effectively, because it wasn't meeting the capital requirements that the new regulation has brought to bear. Now, during about a few weeks, maybe about a month, even indirectly by just contacting to a few of the people, I could see the level of, you know, discomfort going into, you know, verging into potential panic of what would have happened to the Portuguese banking system if the bank would have been resolved. And around that, there were certainly a lot of very important questions as to the legitimacy of such a decision if that were to happen because precisely of the profound implications that it would have in the Portuguese economy, in the Portugal political system, in a variety of different institutions that would be directly affected by such a decision. And so it is definitely a very important topic and one that touches the lives of many peoples and a variety of very important institutions. And so I could not think of a better context than to bring it here to our business school to have so that is a discussion. Because, you know, at the Imperial College Business School, and certainly in this area of finance, we've been really trying to be at the forefront of knowledge. And we have a fantastic group of faculty that's just pushing the boundary in terms of research in a variety of important areas from traditional, um, more established areas such as regulation, you know, macroeconomic stability, uh, in interest rates, and these kinds of things, all the way to more emerging subjects like cryptocurrencies, fintech, you know, virtualization of banks, innovation and entrepreneurship in all sectors, including the financial sector. These are all areas in which some of our faculty are really contributing to the understanding of some of these phenomena. But we're, what we're also very much aware is that to really understand these phenomena, and to really have cutting edge research that's relevant, we need to engage broadly beyond the, the boundaries of our, of our school and our, of our university. So it's fora like this around important topics, issues that really are relevant to what we do in terms of research, but are relevant to the lives and to many firms and institutions that really make good about this other part, which is this engagement with society and making sure that what we are doing is relevant and is touching you know, the lives of people and companies and institutions. And so this is what I think we have here today, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to, to open this, and I'd like to thank in particular, you know, Franklin Allen and the Brevin Howard Center for the uh, work that has been doing precisely to create these opportunities for engagement. We've been talking about the fact that we've been having a variety of these, which is, you know, very good because it means of all the, the important and relevant things that we're trying to um, to discuss and to uh, put together, but the rest of the team that have been involved in, in setting in, in setting this uh, institution. To all of you for coming here to discuss, but certainly to our two um, uh, guests, special guests, uh, uh, particularly first Sir Paul Tucker, who is the author of the, um, of the book and who is um, going to be speaking uh, to us about the ideas that, uh, that are behind the quest, an elected power, the quest for legitimacy in a central banking and the regulatory uh, uh, state. Um, and then uh, we're going to do this as a you know, question and answers interview conversation to get uh, a more informal and perhaps um, uh, more serendipitous tone to some of the uh, conversation with uh, Stephen uh, Sacchetti um, that uh, is going to be leading this, um, uh, this discussion. So uh, I think most of you, if not all of you, know, know Sir Paul Tucker, but let me, um, you know, let me tell you for those that are, may not be so familiar is that with his uh, experience that he joined the Systemic Risk Council as a chair in December 2015. He previously served as the deputy governor for the Bank of England between 2009 and 2013, where he was the member of the Monetary Policy Committee, Financial Policy Committee, Prudential Regulatory Authority Board, and the Court of Directors. 
He was also internationally a member of the steering committee of the G20 in Financial Stability Board. Um, he chaired this committee on the resolution of cross-border banks, and he has also had a variety of um, you know, academic affiliation. He's currently a senior fellow at the Harvard Business School and the former uh, senior fellow at the Kennedy School of um, Government, and uh, he was granted a knighthood for his service to central banking in 2014, and it's really a pleasure to, to have you here, uh, Paul. And then uh, leading the discussion is going to be uh, Stephen, who's the Rosen Family Chair in International Finance in, in Brandeis International Business School. Um, he started at Brandeis and, um, for a number of years, but he also had a five-year uh, term as an economic advisor and head of the Monetary Economic Department at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel. And so uh, you can see that how much we have here a uh, great uh, uh, duo of author and discussant with a lot of experience, academic and uh, real world experience and a, a great audience. So thank you very much for coming and uh, you know, have a great session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's really my, my honor to be here and to speak with, with Paul. Uh, so we just heard a little bit about Paul. I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Oh, no, please. please. No, this is better. We're in England. <laughs> uh, Paul, uh, Paul did spend 33 years at the Bank of England and did all of these things. But uh, I met Paul in uh, 1997. I believe at the time he was running the Monetary Strategy Division. Um, and uh, after that, he put together uh, the Financial Stability Report. Uh, first of all, I remember walking into his office and uh, and at the time I wasn't aware of the sort of shabby elegance of British uh, institutions and there was this green felt tablecloth and I couldn't quite understand what this was but uh, um, but uh, it was it was interesting because um, he was working on financial stability already at the time um, and uh, we did discover however the truth uh, about the regime that was in place uh, during that period, um, and uh, that was a, if you gave a central bank a price stability objective, what you got was low and stable inflation, and if you gave them a financial stability objective, you got a financial stability report, and that's what Paul was was uh, was producing at the time. But it actually, I think it, uh, it with the financial crisis, we we learned quite a lot, and. Uh, we learned about the insufficient capital in our institutions. We learned uh, about the insufficient resolution regimes we had. We learned about the poor market structures that we had. Paul was a leader in the international regulatory reform during the period uh, when I was at the BIS working with him. Uh, he was a leader in the uh, creation of a safer and more resilient system. Um, he was a designer of the UK system that we have today, uh, which I think we'll probably get, we'll discuss a bit in a moment. Uh, he was the chair of the Financial Stability Board's group that developed bail-in and single point of entry for resolution. I think this is, a, this is an incredibly important and still not quite finished task. I think it's, uh, in that sense, we, it's a loss that, uh, that Paul, uh, Paul uh, left the system. Um, Paul was also uh, the chair of what at the time was called the Committee on Payment and Settlement Systems and created a set of core principles for financial market infrastructure. Um, we've heard about, the, we've heard, heard about some of his, uh, his honors, um, but since Paul left the Bank of England in 2013, he spent much of his time thinking about how we should organize our society uh, in order to ensure that our economic and financial policy, as well as other policies, uh, are done in a manner that's consistent with the tenets of liberal democracy. So I think that brings us to the book. And, uh, and that brings us to, to my, my first question, which is a very simple one. And that is, why did you write the book? And in particular, why did you give it the title oh. that, you, that you did? <laughs> Steve, first of all, thank you very much. Thank Franklin Imperial for holding this event. My editor, Sarah Caro from Princeton University Press is here and I should um, thank her for being such a support and, and guiding me. I worked for this book on 
three and a half years. But, but most of all, thank you for you. It's quite something for so many people to give up part of a nice evening in, in, in London. I hope you find something of interest in the, in the book. Wh wh why did I write the book? Um, for, for two reasons, um, which were initially separate in my head and, and then came together. The first was, as you were kind enough to say, um, I was very closely involved with the debates in London about what powers after the crisis should come to the Bank of England, a a as indeed perhaps I should acknowledge Matt Hancock, who had been my private secretary in the early 2000s, and he and I used to um, play Fantasy Bank of England after, after work, and we, we didn't ex ever expect to get an opportunity to apply what we'd discussed, but we did. And, and during that period, um, we, Mervyn King, I, perhaps especially I in some respects, leant against the bank being given certain powers. And all, what powers were, new powers were given, and I certainly wanted some new powers to be given to the Bank of England. We wanted them heavily constrained and qualified. And I wanted to write down what was going on in my mind, and to some extent, I believe in, in Mervyn's. But, but there was a broader theme as well, one I've come to care about rather more, which is this is somebody from within technocracy saying that technocracy should retreat. And it, so by technocracy, I mean independent regulatory agencies, central bankers, activist judges. I believe that technocracy should retreat in the interests, in its own interests, in the interests of it holding on to its power, but also in the much more important cause of helping to preserve our system of government, representative democracy. So there's a great debate going on about populism versus technocracy. And, and mo most people um, spend their time attacking populism. Um, and I want to say, no, no, um, as well as that, perhaps, um, the technocracy itself shouldn't um, overreach. It's a, it's a, this, this book is about the, how wonderful it is to live in under representative democracy and its ultimate message, its, ult its last sentence, in fact, is a call to legislators to step up to the plate and do the job that only they can do as people that we elect. I mean, if I say that in the States, and I was recently in various cities in the United States, this is a very live issue there where confidence in Congress has, has eroded somewhat, um, not just since the presidential election, but over many years. And, and no, 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 we can't, we can't give up. And if I add an extra, can I add one more sentence? What's marvelous about representative democracy um, is that it separates how we as citizens feel about the government of the day from how we feel about the system of government. That when inevitably, and I was, I was in public service and public office for long enough to know that every part of public life government eventually messes up. Uh, on a, sometimes on a grand scale, sometimes on a small scale. The wonder of representative democracy is that you can vote out, you can sack the people that were responsible, except that you can't sack um, people as I was, people who hold power um, and were unelected. And that's part of the point, but it needs to be very carefully designed. And, and I have things to say about all the major Western democracies in a nutshell for what it's worth, I think this country has become casual about where government power is held. Let's dig a, a tiny bit deeper into this because I think that one of, the, one of the real benefits of the book, where I think I really learned quite a lot, was in your discussions about the criteria for delegation. It's one thing to say that you know, we're delegating too much or too little, uh, but I think you've gone well beyond that by trying to set up a set of criteria. And you propose principles that are related to uh, you know, clarity and stability of social goals, problems of credible commitment, et cetera. Could you help us to understand the nature of those principles and, and how, you arrived, uh, how you arrived at them? So, so first of all, let me just give us a, a very brief map of the book. The book has four parts. The first part is, um, it draws on the political economy part of economics. It's, and it draws on my own technocratic background. It's, it's what principles would, would an economist tell you um, should drive whether and how to delegate to insulated agencies. So by an independent agency, I mean an agency that is insulated from the day-to-day -day politics 
of both the executive branch and the legislative branch. Part two says, well, what about our, our, our political values, the rule of law, constitutionalism, and democracy, and says, so what you've written down so far, does it stack up when you hold them against that light? And, and the answer is, well, quite, but we actually need to add some stuff, particularly about public debate. The third part says, well, is any of this um, um, feasible um, technically under the real world constitutions of the major democracies and is it likely to happen in any of them? And then the fourth part is about applying it to central banking. So where do I end up with the principles? And they're, they're going to sound innocuous more than um, they are. And I'll mention just maybe three or four. Um, and you, you interrupt me mm -hmm. as, as I go on. One, which will sound completely innocuous, but I don't think it is, um, is that there should be broadly settled um, public preferences on the mission that's being delegated. And th that sounds obvious, but if you think about the debate, perhaps particularly in the United States, but not only there, about environmental policy, there, there are lots of people in America, and there are actually lots of people in Europe, that look at what the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, and its new leader are doing, and, and are very angry and are very fed up. But actually, there are lots of people in America who are delighted and are hugely supportive of the new dispensation environmental policy there. And th the truth is that when people call for the, for the EPA being more insulated from the president, I would suggest that there isn't actually the broad-based based support for, for the environmental mission that would warrant that. Now, you contrast that with price stability compared with when I was young, there is no constituency out there arguing, could we have a bit more inflation? Could we have inflation higher or more variable? Or even more, there, there, there's nobody, I think, um, apart from a few crackpots, probably a few people in finance, um, arguing, arguing for, could we have more financial crises? Could we have a less stable financial system? Could crises actually come around more frequently? Or when they, when they come, could they, could they be bigger? Um, than that. And so there is, I would say, you know, there is broad-based, not only bipartisan, but broad-based public support for that. So I think that test actually amounts to something. And I think the EPA um, debate in the United States, which is highly contested, um, kind of illustrates that. A second one, and this does a massive amount of work in the, in the book, is that um, an independent agency should be given an objective by elected politicians which is monitorable, which is clear and monitorable. So in this country, there are independent agencies that would have three or four objectives that are equally ranked and all of them would be vague. So they decide, the policymaker or policymakers, they decide how to make um, the trade-offs. They're deciding high policy. Um, the FCA is, is an example of, of that. Um, Ofcom is an example. Um, of, of that. Um, and that in the United States, it's not a completely independent agency. That would be true of the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Antitrust Body, the Federal Trade Commission, the FCC, the Communications Media Authority. In every single case, um, the objective is vague. In the States, for all of those bodies, it is somewhat mitigated by the fact that they have to go back to Congress every year for money. And that makes them sensitive to the ebb and flow of sentiment in Congress. And I've ended up thinking that's, that's a good thing in, in, in some respects. So that does a lot of work. Uh, and in, in terms of my former world um, in central banking, this, 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 is, this is a big deal for financial stability policy and for banking supervision policy. Let me, let me ask you about, the, about the, uh, the, the principles again, because it seems as if some of the principles, one of them is about concerns distributional issues. Yeah. That in some ways what you're trying to do is get away from what I would call sort of tax policy. Yeah. But at some level all of this stuff looks like tax policy to me. Am I missing something? Only something very subtle. <laughs> um, so I think there's a difference between choices <laughs> and effects. Um, so what Steve is alluding to is that the kind of central motivator in the book of why you should want to delegate to insulated officials in the first place is, is getting credible commitment to the promises of, of government. And, and just to, since that's associated with monetary policy, 
I just want to underline that it has nothing to do specially with monetary policy. The reason that we have an independent judiciary is in part because we want the state to make a credible commitment that the adjudication of disputes will be fair, impartial, and consistent over, over time and across cases. In fact, government, any, any part of government, is riddled with credible commitment um, problems. So why, uh, as Alan Blinder famously posed in an article in Foreign Affairs in 1997, why not delegate absolutely everything? everything? And the answer is, well, because you don't want to delegate choices on big distributional issues and um, questions of, of values. But that's not the same as distributional effects. Bog standard monetary policy has distributional effects in the short run. Um, they might wash out over time. Um, things like QE definitely have um, um, distributional effects, and frankly, I think we were slow to recognise that and slow to own up to it when I was part of when I was part of we. Um, but I but I think having effects and making choices, so you know, choosing to favour one part of the community over another, we don't we don't want that in unelected hands, and particularly in this country. You know, this is Simon de Montfort stuff. This is why we have parliamentary authority. Um, at all. I finally found a country where I can say that with understanding. L let me just emphasize that um, while we, we will come to, we're, we're coming, I think, going to come quickly to talk about central banks and financial regulation a bit more, the, the book is really about, uh, about delegation in general. Mm. Um, it lives, in my view, at the intersection of politics, um, philosophy, law, economics, and finance. It's really, a, it, it's really, in that way, I think, a, a tour de force. And um, you mentioned a bit about populism earlier, but I want to explore that a little bit more before we go on. Um, looking at the world today, and we see a rise in populism, we see a general reconsideration of the part that the state plays in, uh, in, in, the, in society. Um, how do you see this as contributing, really, to that discussion? As, as, I, as I said earlier, it's to do with technocracy, recognizing that it needs to retreat a bit and not overextend itself. It is very easy. You and I know people um, who have written papers and, and who are going to write more papers um, that say, in the macro finance world, and actually, we really need this instrument, and, and we'll only have, be able to uh, use this instrument with credibility, therefore give it to the central bank. And I would say, no, 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 no. It's not just positive economics. You have to, you have to think about where should the powers of the state lie. And I, I want unelected people to have the least set of powers they can have to do their job. And, I, and least actually means being easy to track so that we, the people, intermediated by journalists and the cognoscenti through crucially through parliaments, can track whether they're trying to do the job, and if they are trying, whether they're doing it tolerably well or, or not. Let me now turn just briefly, or well, maybe not so briefly, to monetary and financial stability policy, um, and, and ask first about the US and, the, and, the, and Europe, and whether or not you feel that the systems, and these are complex systems of uh, of regulation on the monetary and financial side, uh, the, the degree to which these actually meet the principles of delegation that you've set out, whether or not in some cases there's been over-delegation or, or maybe even under-delegation. Well, let, let, me, let me start with the um, euro area and the ECB. In a sense, it can't possibly meet the um, principles for delegation. The, the ECB has emerged at various points um, as an accidental economic sovereign. And that's because all central banks are quasi-fiscal institutions. To be a quasi-fiscal institution in a, in a constitutional setup where there isn't a political um, fiscal institution is, is a kind of form of, of political agony, in a way, in that when the euro area was faced with existential um, disaster, the only people that could underpin that part of the European project was the ECB. Now, looking back, I think that um, the ECB leaders should have gone to the Council of Ministers. There's a subtle, subtlety here in intergovernmental mode to ask them whether they um, wanted their project um, saved. I mean, 
couldn't, not easy to do, and so it's not an easy thing to say. I'm not a, I don't think I'm an innocent or naive um, person, but I think that the debate about the ECB's extraordinary power would have been a bit more palatable if at that moment um, they had had formal um, political endorsement, rather than it playing out years later um, in the Constitutional Sorry, Court. Any, so anyone who has read, uh, in terms of the legal challenge to the ECB, the judgment to read is the very final judgment of the German Constitutional Court responding to the ECJ's decision. And this, this judgment, fascinatingly, essentially reads as accepting, inevitably, the EC's, ECJ's judgment, um, but it's pretty fed up and is, is, is kind of like a protest judgment. And you think, actually, you know, this is what happens when there isn't broad political endorsement. So, so I, maybe this is just a, a naive question from someone who spends most of their time on the other side of the Atlantic, but there is this thing called the European Parliament. And why is it that they don't have the role that you're... Because, this, because, because ultimately, um, because at the point of existential um, collapse, you have to go to the people whose project it is. Um, and that is that it's a confederation. That is the member states in intergovernmental mode. And actually, every single important moment in the history of the EU, when they have innovated forwards or backwards, however you want to define those things, has tended to be intergovernmental. And that's, that's not an accident. That's because it's a confederation. It is a shared project amongst those um, member states. And what about the US case? What about um, the, the US case is different. So, I mean, um, I think it is problematic that the Federal Reserve sets its own, um, the FOMC, Federal, Federal Open Markets Committee, sets its own um, objective. Now. Um, it's it, in the form of an inflation target, um, a de facto inflation target, and an interpretation of maximum sustainable um, employment. And I think it'd be reasonable, people have said to me, oh, but you can't possibly expect Congress to do that, or Congress to delegate that power to Treasury. Um, and I think that's broadly right. But then I think the Fed should have consulted widely and publicly on that. And they did speak to Congress, members of Congress, privately about that. And my answer is, well, you should have done it publicly. And you should have done it publicly so that um, you weren't deciding the inflation tax. Um, it was being decided by people who were elected. And th th this may seem techy. In the United States, and I think you'll warrant this, that whether it be on the right or the left, the Fed has real enemies. Um, and some of them are in Congress and in the House especially. Bill after bill is tabled um, that would deprive the Federal Reserve of, of powers and none of them have passed the Senate. Um, but one day they will unless, unless the Federal Reserve can present itself to the United States as kind of somehow squarely in line with America's yeah. values. No, I mean, I agree. There, there, there are actually two kinds of bills and it's hard to know which one will pass. One of them is about... One of them is about a, uh, a monetary policy rule, but the other one that's much more pernicious is about subjecting the Federal Reserve to the budgetary process of the U.S. Congress. And that the loss of budgetary independence would effectively eliminate the independence. Yeah, of it's for everything other than monetary policy, but yeah. it would, it would, the, ba the borderline well, is so fuzzy that it would be, an, it would be so a very big deal. Um, let, let, me, let me then finally turn in this particular way, uh, on this particular one, to the U.K., so, uh, so you were you were one of the designers of the current system with its three uh, with its three overlapping overlapping committees, and uh, and how do you view those then in this con in the context of your principles? I guess I wish it were clearer that the job of the financial policy committee was underpinning the resilience of the financial system rather than leaning against credit booms and asset price booms, because I don't know how to track whether a body trying to, I don't know if they are trying to do it, by the way, but the legislation, I'm not sure it precludes them from doing it. The legislation tilts them towards resilience, but I'm not sure it precludes them chasing after bubbles, and I'm not sure how that can be monitored. The other thing I would say is that I think one of the great strengths of the monetary policy system here, an example to others in the,
world is minority votes. Notice they're called minority votes, not dissenting votes. That's not um, um, insignificant. And I think those minority votes help to reveal where disagreement is and help to focus public um, debate. And on the, in, on the regulatory side, micro and macro, as far as I know, and I, forgive me if I'm wrong about this, I don't think there have been any minority votes. And you know, watch what happened when recently in the Fed board, Lael Brainard voted against Jay Powell and Randy Qualls on a regulatory um, measure, relaxing the leverage ratio. The details don't matter. And, and the, the, the great thing about that um, was that it has absolutely enhanced public debate in the United States about that measure. That otherwise, because the, the, we haven't said this, but the most important thing in my book, in a way, is, is the, how tremendously important testimony to Congress, um, the European Parliament, the House of Commons is. And it's very, very hard for them to do their job if there aren't any gaps between um, um, people. And you, you then, in the United States, with monetary policy, you tend to get chair-dominated testimony um, because basically policy is always going to follow the, the, the chair. Now, when the Bank of England was made um, independent for monetary policy in 1997, I can remember Eddie George and Mervyn King both thinking this will enhance the quality of debate about monetary policy in this country, and it did. And somehow disagreement, not easy, to, you shouldn't fabricate disagreement, but you know something like that is still needed on regulatory policy. How can it be that in every country, regulatory policymakers in the SSM in Europe or in the um, um, in the board in the United States, that everyone always agrees about um, everything. It's not. It's not possible. Let me let me just say one more question, and then we'll take uh, take some questions from the audience. Um, and I want to continue on financial stability policy um, because I think my, my sense is that we uh, the, the, the the two of us surely agree that we hope that uh, to have a policy framework that's analogous to the one for inflation targeting that we were able to put in place 20 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but that would mean having an agreed upon and measurable objective. Yeah. It would mean having uh, a, a clarity about tools that would be able, that we would be able to use in order to meet that objective and calibration of those tools as to how they would link to the objective. Now, a academics and the official sector researchers are hard at work trying to create this analytical structure. Um, but I think it would be fair to say that we don't have it. So in the meantime, how should we proceed um, both with the policy and with the governance so in I order think, to ensure legitimacy? So I think, I think, so I'm completely with you um, if the regime is conceived in terms of manage the credit cycle, manage asset price bubbles. And that doesn't mean that no one should do that. Elected people could, could do that. I mean, you know, it is okay for elected people to take some policy decisions. Um, um, I think it can be done for resi the resilience of the system. Um, I think you can obviously specify the objective in terms of resilience. Um, but I think stress testing and publishing the results of stress testing um, makes a huge difference to that. And, and let me, before you open it up, let me just say this. When, when I started it back in 1980, and, and for a while longer, probably the next 25 years, um, supervisors and regulators around the world would say two things, which in combination I've come to think of as outrageous. They, 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 would, um, um, they would say, it is absolutely vital that we be independent. So you will find that in something called the Basel Principles, Core Principles for Banking principles. Supervision, yes. yes? You will yes. find it in our, IOSCO's absolutely. Principles for Securities Regulation. You will find it in endless IMF um, papers. And yet the very same people will say, particularly for prudential supervision, it is absolutely vital that we don't publish what we are doing um, because it's, it's proprietary information about banks and dealers and it would be dangerous to, um, to, to publish it. So we can't tell you what we're doing, but it is absolutely vital that we're independent and we be insulated from politics. Well, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm slightly ashamed, actually, that I, mean, I did think this before I retired from, from office, but I'm slightly ashamed that that 
the kind of appallingness of this didn't occur to me years earlier. Of course you can't allow people to be completely opaque if you've insulated them from day-to-day -day, um, politics. And stress testing, which I think was America's um, main innovation and, and achievement during the, the worst of the, the crisis, um, it holds out promise on, on this. And every time that anyone wants to retreat from being transparent and naming banks and what was wrong with those banks, and I remember, um, well, maybe you wanted to could do that in other parts of the world, but not, not in, in the democracies. Well, we could have a long discussion, I'm sure, about, uh, about confidentiality and transparency of prudential regulation and when and what, where we should do it. But let's, uh, let me open the, the, the floor to, to questions. Um, I think that we have some people that have microphones. So if you would raise your hand and please, uh, please identify yourself. Um, and, by you and by no means restrict yourself to central banking. And the book talks yes, about an antitrust no, and utility right, regulation. Can, yes. Antitrust yes. ended Foods, up bothering me a lot. Food safety, one of my personal ah, favorites. Yes. Um, yes, please. And, uh, Peter Wilson Smith from Meritus Consultants. Paul, could I ask you about um, a question about the reasons behind the growth of this, uh, the regulatory state, the administrative state? I mean, you talked about how it was sort of motivated by giving credibility to um, commitments, uh, uh, credible commitment to the promises of government. Um, and you've seen the growth of this, these unaccountable institutions who, and you were sort of implying that they relish their accountability. I mean, it seems to me that it, one of the things it's done is to reduce the accountability of politicians, and in a way quite deliberately so, because certainly in the UK context, I mean, I can think of examples where politicians have had exerted considerable influence over bodies like the Bank of England or something like the Student Loan Company or other non-governmental organisations, and it allows them, you know, when things go wrong, because these are not you know, they're sort of independent bodies, politicians can uh, absolve themselves of responsibility for mistakes, but still retain a considerable amount of influence. I mean, do you think that there's a sort of cynical motivation behind this too? That, that, that is certainly where the political science literature in the United States has ended up. If you go back to the beginning of the 20th century, this really began at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century in the States, it was partly um, because of concern about um, the inadequacies of government by um, Congress and courts with a very limited executive branch. By, by the 40s, um, late 30s during the New Deal, it was all about expertise, the cult of the, of the expert. And then political scientists came along and said, well, these experts get captured by the industry they're regulating. And so why, do, why, do, why, do, why does Congress delegate all of this? Well, because they want to shift blame. In Europe, it developed much later. Um, it really happened on both sides of the, um, the, the channel when, when lots of utility industries were privatized. And in some countries, um, they were privatized with the, in France, for example, with the state continuing to hold a stake. And so you needed to regulate these industries because they were, they were monopolists and but no longer controlled by people who were elected. But you couldn't have the state bo both being partial owner and being regulator. So there, was, there were different forces pointing in the same um, direction. I think, I think that, though, it wasn't just politicians trying to shift blame. It was a, a much more profound shift in the economic model um, that they believed their countries, again, on both sides of the um, continent should have. There was, there was then a kind of phase, and it's probably continued in this country, of setting up an agency, an independent agency, being the answer to, to everything. And I was fascinated that France has probably had the richest debate about all of this in recent years, both in the Constitutional Court and in the Conseil d'État, uh, and also in the Senate. The French Senate issued a, a report two, uh, two or three, four years ago maybe, that was incredibly critical about the regime. And the Assembly, which has more kind of traction in legislation, passed um, generic legislation around independent agencies that removed the independence of some because it was no longer thought that they warranted independence and set out a framework that limited them. And part of the objective, I think, was to ensure that ministers were more accountable 
can't talk about ministers in quite the same way in the United States. Um, but that comes back to the monitorable objective. If, you, if, you, if, the, if, if the parameters of the regime are clearly set by politicians, you want to split the accountability. You want the politicians to be accountable for the design of the regime. You want the unelected people to be accountable for the operation of the, of the regime. So in our old world, when people say, let's increase the inflation target because of the zero bound problem, for all sorts of reasons, that is not a decision that should be taken by the Fed or the ECB. It's a decision that should be taken at a, a higher um, level. And those people are accountable for it, the people that we elect. It's the difference between goal and instrument. It is exactly that. Uh, in the front here, yes, ma'am. Hi, Denai Kirakapulu from OMFIF. How does the premise that central banks' powers have increased so much and the remits have expanded, which is certainly true for developed economy central banks, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, um, contrast with the reality in many central banks elsewhere in the world, particularly emerging markets, which are looking to these central banks as an example, and they're still struggling to get independence from the government. And it's something that we've seen also in the Euro area recently, in Latvia, in Greece. So how is, is the pendulum too far in one direction for some central banks and in the other direction from, for other central banks that are still trying to get independence? Well, my, 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 my book is about legitimacy in healthy democracies, and I, and I assume throughout that we're talking about healthy democracies, and that, that, that's a lot of work, in, in, in fact, analytically. But I think you, you identify a really important point, because whether it be in emerging markets today or in countries like this 25, 30 years ago, there's, there's, at a high level of generality, there is a shift from legitimacy through expertise, through know-how, through what I call pragmatic authority, to legitimacy through formal delegation from parliament. The reason this matters is because it isn't a, com a comfortable journey. So in this country, um, part of what happened when the Bank of England was given monetary independence and banking supervision was taken away uh, which Parliament and the government had every right to do, was that the historical pragmatic authority of the Bank of England over the uh, banking system was thrown um, in the dustbin. And the costs of that became apparent in the summer of 2007 when Northern Lot Rock occurred. That's at a, I think historians won't, they'll be less interested in the detail about that as what happens when you decide that a certain kind of pragmatic authority is no longer um, needed. And you know, my view is that typically doesn't work well. What happens in emerging markets is that even when they are given even independence, the, the government of the day and the people and the public and the media end up looking to the central bank to do all sorts of things that have nothing to do with central banking narrowly defined, but actually try to, as people would say these days, lever off the pragmatic authority of the um, um, of the central bank because it stands at the center of the payment system and the banking system. And so you need to, it, it's, people will think about setting up an independent central bank as just about the central bank. And I think that's, I think that's, I don't really talk about this very much in the book. I think it's a pretty big mistake actually. You have to think about if we're going to stop them doing loads of things and we as I then was, we gave up loads of functions before 97 in order to position ourselves for independence. That hasn't often been said before. Um, that no one really thought about where these functions should be picked up or whether they should be picked up um, at all. I think people have to take great care about designing, well, about designing the institutions of government. And the, the extraordinary thing is that 200 years ago, people were incredibly careful about it. In your country, Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton, in, in my country, um, Locke. Um, Hume and Hobbes, they talked about institutional things, not just abstract things. Roll forward um, 200 years, no one talks about, is interested in the structure of government at all. No wonder people are fed up. I mean, I think that, uh, I, th I, th I find this interesting because uh, I, I remember when we, when we were uh, first set setting up these things that we called macro prudential regulation, which I'm still not sure exactly what that is. Um, but. Uh, but it turns out that when you go around the world, that, that especially in a lot of countries, they want to they, they put a long list of things underneath yeah. this that are extremely interventionist. Uh, 
and including, in, well, in some places, starting with capital controls. And so, and so you, you, you're left asking the question of if you give this to a central bank, um, what are you giving them in terms of, uh, in terms of control over your, over your financial system? Can I give the New Zealand needs? example? Absolutely, please So the do. New Zealand example, one, the story I'm going to tell is, is almost completely true. There is, there is a slight um, elision. They're very it. far away so, anyway. So, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, so New Zealand had a housing um, bubble, and so the Reserve Bank introduced caps on I think loan-to-income ratios. It might have been loan-to-value ratios. It really doesn't matter for the story which both. one it is. And, and it kind of worked across New Zealand as a whole, except it didn't work in Auckland. And so the Reserve Bank reduced, in, introduced tighter requirements on loan-to-income ratios. You may have been there the day I learned this in a yeah. conference, and I said, oh my god, imagine this were London. Um, so this would be, imagine UK, it's only in London, except it isn't, only, it isn't all of London. It's actually, it's not Hackney and Tower Hamlets. It's only Kensington and Chelsea. Yeah, they except they it isn't, postal codes. It isn't, or only, it isn't mm -hmm. only Kensington, it isn't all of Kensington mm -hmm. and Chelsea, mm -hmm. which is kind of quite a mixed area. It's only parts of Chelsea. In fact, it's only, there are some mm -hmm. streets that are, you know, why not name the families? And if you put it like mm -hmm. that, you know, we're not even sure we want our elected people to do that, let alone our unelected um, people, but you can do the same thing in a different way. Now, the Bank of England was given this power after Mervyn and I left. We had said that we, I had an op-ed in the um, FT that said we oppose having this power, um, but actually, they don't need it. Um, in late 2014, well after I'd gone, they did something I thought was brilliant in terms of getting through this, which is put a cap on the proportion of banks' mortgage portfolios that can be accounted for by mortga mortgages with LTVs above X percent. So that way you haven't intervened with the liberal, this is, and behind this is a liberal principle of proportionality. You haven't inter intervened, an unelected person hasn't intervened with the liberal freedoms of citizens in the country. They have done something less that's, that respects those liberal freedoms, but nevertheless can deliver um, the objective of a resilient financial um, system. And this matters. And you know, if this were Germany, I think we would see the German court strike down um, a power like that in unelected um, hands. Uh, John, please. Uh, <coughs> Jonathan Haskell, Imperial College. C can I ask you, Paul, about um, the utility regulation side? And apologies if, if this is in your book and I haven't got to it yet. So if I think, for example, of gas and electricity regulation, you know, what we say to the regulators for, I think, the reasons you just say is we delegate it to the regulators to have the interests of consumers. But since gas and electricity prices have got strong distributional, uh, uh, um, co you know, consequences, especially for poor households, we say they've got to ha the regulators have got to have particular regard to, yeah. you know, pensioners, uh, retirees, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, people in rural areas and low-income people. Is that an example of exactly the problem you're pointing yes. out where this is... This, this doesn't work, or is that an, uh, a good ex a example of good regulation? It's an example of bad regulation in the sense of, of, of alignment with our deep political democratic principles. So the have regards thing in the UK, first of all, they're relatively untested in the courts, so no one knows um, how, how a have regards can be satisfied. And there's something in the book about how many have regards in another field, the PRA and the FCA have. Um, but the other thing in the field that you're responding to is that there was a, there was a good initiative, which I th my impression is that it went slightly off track, in that um, under, under the Cameron Osborne government, decided that there should be what's called a strategic steer, I think those are the colloquial words, from the sponsoring minister um, to the independent agency. And the, the equivalent for the Monetary Policy Committee is... Um, it's got longer over time, sadly, but it's pretty specific. Um, whereas these strategic um, steers, um, well, the rumor is that they're passed around Whitehall and everybody kind of chips in their, their um, thing. And of course, if the, the, the vaguer they are and the more you pile in, the less work they do in constraining the regulator. The regulator needs to be in a position where, well, I did that because I had to do that. I, I was making, I, I was exercising some discretion, but cabined discretion. The, the biggest case, I think, of this away from 
um, central banking, which I think is problematic, and not everyone agrees with this, is around antitrust policy. So this country hasn't had um, an independent antitrust um, agency for very long. The United States has kind of had independent antitrust for a very, very long time. And in the, somewhere, sometime in the 70s, edging into the 80s, beginning in some ways in the late 60s, there was a massive change of doctrine from the so-called Harvard School to the so-called um, Chicago School. Uh, and I, I want to say that this change in doctrine was so massive um, that actually it should have had, this should have gone via Congress in my um, view. Instead, actually, it didn't even come out of the agencies. It came from the judges. The way the, where the Chicago people were shrewd is, hey, we, we, we've, got to, we've got to educate the judges. And, and uh, my objection isn't on the substance, particularly. I have some, some slight worries about the substance, my, um, because the substance was just reflecting advances in economics. My, my concern is, is who chooses? And, you know, 40 years on, it turns out that we have um, conglomerates of such a scale that they have political power as well as, um, well, not conglomerates, companies, businesses of such a scale that they have political power um, as well as economic power. Well, that's exactly where Brandeis began when he was advising Wilson at the beginning of the 20th century. That is exactly where the auto liberals were in trying to design German antitrust policy after the Second World War. Why? Because guess what? Really big companies uh, had been more than complicit, but had been enabling of the horrors that occurred in Germany and Japan. That, that if you decide something in competition policy, you're not just doing a little bit of economic policy. You're doing something you know, much bigger. And you think, God, is that for unelected judges and unelected people like me? I think not. I mean, people disagree with this, but I think, I think not. Other, other questions? There's, oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, the, the light is in my eyes. I'm uh, having a hard time seeing, please. Okay. Uh, Puru, Puru Vignes Warren from Imperial College London, MBA student. So with increasing, if there is increasing regulation of cryptocurrencies, how do you think uh, this is going to have an effect on um, world banking systems going forward? What are your thoughts on that? Oh. You should probably ask somebody in office rather than, <laughs> than, than me. Um, I, 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 you want me to answer it for you? Well, you know what I've written about this, so I'll, <laughs> go, I'll just say go, what go I've right written ahead. about it. Um, so I think central banks should be very careful about issuing cryptocurrencies themselves. And that, that's to say um, that they shouldn't think of it. In, in 2004, I suggested at a Bank of England away day that we think through the pros and cons of... Um, Crypto, issuing cryptocurrency or issuing e-money, e as I, central bank e-money, as I called it, the away day. And I think, I think was kind of politely told to shut up, which, which, which I, it was polite, actually. It was, um, and so I, so I did that. Um, but, you know, the, the thing about a central bank issuing um, e-money is all of you having, uh, well, and us having accounts, citizens having accounts, at the central bank is it starts with money, just like the Chicago plan in the 1930s. It starts with money and it becomes about credit. That um, the, the most important, people are talking about the, the new technology changing the architecture of banking. The architecture of banking, the, the basic architecture of banking hasn't changed since the end of the 18th century when Francis Baring talked about the lender of last resort for the first time. The technology is the really important bit of the architecture is that the allocation of credit is separated from the issuance of the final settlement asset base, base money. That is a big, big deal. And a society could operate, have a different kind of architecture, one in which the central bank was a kind of state development bank, and that, that would be a political choice. But it's not something that one should stumble into or that belongs to the discretion of unelected officials, in, in, in my view. So. Um, I, I've been slightly surprised by when I look around the outside of this country that um, some central banks have kind of got excited about um, this. Uh, let's see. I think there's one here, and then uh, and then in the back, if we can get a go, go ahead. Um, sometimes in, in stock markets, they cease trading. They stop trading when the stock falls too much. But they normally don't stop trading when it rises a lot. Um, when uh, you're in a central bank, sometimes it seems like there's a, an incentive to keep rates low 
and to retire looking good, like in the case of Alan Greenspan? Do you think there's a positive bias in how those kind of interest rates are set? And do you think there's a way to combat it? I think that um, the Federal Reserve has inclined to be too bothered about volatility on Wall Street. Um, and m more volatile than, more sensitive to volatility on Wall Street than I think is, um, than is warranted by its, by its mission. You see that in the reaction to the taper tantrum. It's not that I think the taper tantrum was a good thing. People asked me about it at the time, and I said, well, I can tell you what it would have been like when Eddie was the governor and I was the markets director. He'd have called up and said, hmm, that wasn't very, wasn't very good. Anyone bust? And I say, no, no, no one's bust. Well, never mind, not our finest day. And that would have been the end of it. There wouldn't have been, there would not have been the hand-wringing that there was about upsetting Wall Street. Now, this is, this is easy to say. It's harder to live with. And that's partly because, certainly in the United States, to some extent here as well, the, the, the transmission mechanism goes, and I don't mean economic transmission mechanism, I mean kind of public response transmission mechanism, goes central bank does something, Wall Street responds, people on the desks in Wall Street um, brief the media, if Wall Street's very angry, well, media doesn't necessarily support them, but it gets front page news, that gets amplified by Congress, that manifests itself in pressure on the leaders of the, of the Fed. So it's uncomfortable when when you do something that causes volatility. But um, as Jeremy Stein has argued eloquently, um, that, that is not part of the objection, objective function. And it's kind of pretty counterproductive for it to be so, because you then end up trying to dampen volatility, which ends up um, compressing um, signals of the amount of risk that is naturally in the, in the system. Disguising the signals of risk um, isn't a good thing in the long run. I have three more. Uh, in the back, please. Identify yourself, please. Hi. Uh, Paul, it's, it's Ed Conway from uh, Sky News and the, the Times and all those things. Um, congratulations on, on the book. It's a, it's a really important contribution to, you know, to an area which needed more research and, and, and investigation. I'm just curious, gi given how much power, unelected power, as the title goes, central bankers now have, are you surprised that people aren't more angry with central bankers, whether you know, you, there's perhaps a, a different spectrum in the US versus the UK and Europe, but are you surprised people aren't specifically more angry with central bankers? Should they be more angry, or is it just manifesting in a kind of different way because it's so nebulous, some of these, these controls and powers that bankers have? So I think the United States and continental Europe are a bit different from the UK, yeah. And, and in continental Europe, as, as, as you know, Ed, um, there'd be greater concern in, in Germany and northern Europe than in the, um, than in the south. Um, the second thing I'd say is, of course, in some respects, so this is different about the allocation of powers, how much a point on how, they, how much they've used their powers, is they've been trapped. Um, we have lived in a world, and this is very, let me step back. If you think about the 1930s, the response to that crash stock market crash, banking crash, economic crash, everything crash. Who fronts it? President Roosevelt, far side chat. I mean, much more so than um, President Bush II or President Obama did. Photographs of who fronted it um, this time around tend to be Hank and Ben and, and, and Tim rather than either of the, of the presidents. Um, and the same was true with kind of r the regulatory reform that came. Um, the statutes passed then in the States in particular tended to be pres prescriptive, whereas this time around essentially there were a series of essay requests to the Fed, CFTC, SEC and others. And my tribe did it in the, in the Basel Tower. The truth is about seven or eight individuals um, did the big, uh, made the big decisions that then occurred around the, the world. And I think this is partly, um, with monetary policy you can see it very clearly with um, the balance of fiscal policy and monetary policy. You get an economic crash and there could be two responses. And let's say, and I am absolutely not talking about the UK, in the United States and continental Europe you can make a pretty good case that there should have been a bit more fiscal stimulus, a bit less monetary stimulus. But it is also absolutely true, a fact of the world is true, that the politicians will pay some short-term price for that with their, in their cabinet, with their base, in their party in Congress.
Um, and so, you know, they're trading off making the world a better place, saving the world, and facing some short-term political costs. So they say, well, what happens if I do nothing? Oh, if I do nothing, the Federal Reserve has to reinvent itself as the US cavalry and on the continent. Oh, if I do nothing, the ECB has to reinvent itself as the, as the cavalry. And this comes back to where Peter started. Something that happens now is there are, there are things where there could be more detailed in legislation, but, but, but why, why do that when, and take the blame, when you, and, or if, even if not the blame, um, get over all the hurdles in passing the legislation when you can hands off and you know somebody else will have to do it. In fact, with regulation, you can pass legislation telling them to do it. And my point is that this is unsustainable. I mean, and on central banking, this is the central dilemma of central banking because they can't solve it. And nor can they go out, as in a way Mario tried at Jackson Hole in, what, 2014, and say, don't expect so much of us. But he, he, I think he, it's easy to say this, and I'm certainly not saying I would have done better. I think if you start saying what the governments, the politicians should do, they get very fed up. Whereas I think they could do more of, don't rely on us to create prosperity. We, we, we can't bring you that. But how, and somehow they need to find a way of doing that without, without scaring people. But I think, that's, I think that's what they've needed to do on either side of the Atlantic, in the Euro area and in the United States over the um, last few years. I mean, m maybe, I've, maybe I'm misconstruing what I'm hearing and seeing, but it sure looks like there are some countries where people are pretty angry at, uh, at yeah. central banks. Uh, and I would say that the United States has a lot of people who are not. And those of you that sit in London, don't imagine that if it happens there and happens in, on, in the Euro area that the UK will s somehow be immune. We, we, you know, maybe we were last to central bank. Maybe we were last into central bank independence. Maybe we'd be last out. But you know, if there was a great trend away from it elsewhere in the world, I would be surprised if the if the UK um, ended up saying, "Well, never mind. We're, we're going to carry on with this I mean, thing that everyone else has given up on." If the new Italian government starts issuing ten euro no notes with Oriana Fallaci on them, I think we're going to be in trouble. So. Um it, they, they're threatening to do exactly that. So, um, let's see. Over here, we have two more questions. Maybe we'll take them together. Is Tim. That, so, uh, Tim Besley from the LSE. I, I was going to invite you to reflect on um, one particular aspect of independent institutions. I have to say, I de perhaps declare an interest. I'm a, a member of the newly created uh, National Infrastructure Commission here, which may fall afoul of some of the logic of your argument. But I think there's a particular reaction to failures in the political process which is about what you might call um, the, the absence of real authority in government. There's formal authority, but is that mapped into real authority? What do I mean by that? The lack of strategic direction on certain policy issues, and I think that's what we're reacting to. If you look at the failure to tackle um, old age support or social care or the absence of uh, dealing with some of the issues that come out with regulating the digital economy, there are repeated examples of failure of government where I think what people want our low sea of expertise, impartial advice, but it has to be inside government. And the Infrastructure Commission is a very interesting example. What we've done a lot of is to convene bodies within government who would simply not get together unless you had a certain amount of very minimal formal authority. Yeah. But then the real authority comes from the fact that we hope in a month's time when we publish the first National Infrastructure Commission report, which is to look at infrastructure needs up to 2050, people will listen and politicians need to be held to account in that sense. Do you advise or decide? Purely advise. I think that's great. So that this is my, my thing is about decisions. I um, and I, I do talk about this in the, in the book. Um, actually, I'm not against independent agencies deciding things, merely, merely being careful about where they do. I think um, for advisory commissions, even more so, the famous case in the United States, is about closing military bases. You probably know this example, where, where agreement can't be reached in Congress because there are lots and lots of military bases, and no one wants to put their hand up to have a military base in their district um, or state um, closed. And so instead, what happens is that, is that Congress basically pre-commits, sets up a body and essentially pre-commits to accept the advice of the body, and that way, um, 
bases do end up getting closed. I, no, no, I, I, I. It was I, a nice I, idea when it worked, but it stopped working. It's they haven't reused it. Well, you you need you need new innovations occasionally to make these things happen. I think independent advisory bodies are tremendously important, and some of the kind of macro finance things that people recommend, I think, well, actually, you know, central bank or some independent regulator advising ministers on that would be a, would be a healthy thing. Last question. David Miles of Imperial College, but before that at the Bank of England. Um, Paul, you're, you're, you're very sensitive to the, what you might call the, the fragility of the legitimacy of unelected officials in central banks. But, I mean, sometimes, as you know very well, um, governments can ask central banks to do things that are bizarre and silly and dangerous. Uh, and shouldn't unelected officials sometimes say to elected officials, no, we won't do that? I, I, I slightly got a sense as I read your book, which I enjoyed very much, of, of, of a slightly defensive frame of mind. Ah, oh dear. Um, I think the answer to that, I think, I think if government um, says informally to the central bank, please do this and that, the answer is just no. Um, I, th I think all of these things should be formal and absolutely above, above the waterline, because otherwise the people can't tell what's going on. Supposing the government said the next time you do QE, you will buy debt issued by small companies in the north of England. That's what you will buy. Yeah. Um, actually so suppose, suppose they were very prescriptive, yeah. but in a, in a public sense, not behind closed doors, not trying to twist arms, just yeah. saying, that's, that's what you will do. Yeah. So I, th I think, um, remember, remember this is never to do with the legitimacy of the agencies, it's to do with the legitimacy of the, of the system of, of, of government. I, I think, in your example, they're only asked, they're asking them to purchase only those things rather than, well, in, in chapter 22, I think, I say, if, if QE or credit easing involves buying private sector paper, it should be spread across the economy as a whole and to the extent that you're p choosing particular issuers, it should be as formulaic as, as possible. And, you know, one of the responsibilities of people that hold these offices is to say, um, well, that's fine, but this should no longer be an independent agency. I, I, the truth is I don't feel the slightest bit defensive about it. When I talk to current and former Fed colleagues, I think that they often feel a need to defend the Fed's independence. Um, but Mervyn and I, I think, we, we, we spent hours talking about this. We didn't feel any, um, it, it's, it's bestowed, and they could turn you into all sorts of things, and then you have to say, well, this, is no longer, this no longer seems to us to be appropriate for an independent, an independent body, and then see what happens. I'm, I'm going to take that. Can I ask one? I, I have one quick question, which I said I would, just one quick question to ask at the end, and that is, Paul, you've now taken the better part of four years to think about this, and I, I, I'm very curious as to whether or not this had, would, if you now could go back to before, to when you were in the Bank of England, whether there was anything that you would do differently than you did. On the, on the FPC, I, I would tweak the clauses on the objective. Uh, my accommodation with Matt, I think I would want to revisit, and also the clause on consensus and voting. Actually, the consensus provision is there because um, I'm trying to get away from what economists would call kind of agenda manipulation, given it's so complicated. The other thing, the much bigger thing, much bigger thing, has nothing to do with this country is, um, this matters most of all in the United States, but for that reason matters here and in Europe, is no general policies on shadow banking. And, and that strikes me as, a, as I, I, think, I think people will, I think we'll all live to regret um, that. And I'm surprised because I think there was, I think there was some momentum behind that in, in 2012 into 2013, but Dan Terullo gave really a really important speech, which I certainly, I hope, gave him some support on, and yet it fizzled out. And I think that I don't know why it fizzled out, um, but I think it's a real, real shame that it did and 
I think in the States, people will live to regret that moment, that decision. We've come to the end of our time, unfortunately, but I'd like to thank uh, Steve and Paul for a fascinating discussion of these really important topics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.